gentleman in the middle. <laughs> Welcome back to our next panel discussion. Um, creativity, we have mentioned it already a few times today, especially during our innovation panel. There was a comment that creativity is a very important source or element for innovation. Just curious, who of you considers yourself creative? Who is creative? Okay, the majority of you, or first all of you. Who considers the output generated through AI may it be text, images, or music creative? A mm, bit more than half, I would say. Well, I'm interested to then continue the conversation with our three experts here on stage. Welcome to SALS21, Jovanke van Wilsdorf. Yes. You are an Welcome. artist profiler and a songwriter. Yes. Um, Matthias Röder from Salzburg, so you didn't have a long journey. Welcome as well. You're the Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're the CEO of Karajan Institute. And Stephanie Meisel from Hello. Vienna. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> an Thanks AI visual me. performance artist. Fantastic. So creativity and AI. Um, there are different opinions. Some say it enables us to be more creative. Others say it hinders us. And I think there's also this differentiation between the creative level and then the artistic level. So just not to confuse those two words, let's start out with the creative level, with the creative industry. And Ivanka, I wanna start with you as you know, a songwriter, having worked in the music industry. What is your approach to AI and how has your journey with AI been? Um, I actually came to working with AI not over music, but over a story. So okay. writing a record through the eyes of a virtual creature, then trying to build a whole story around it, or actually writing it, and then having to research, discovering my nerd gene, mm -hmm. because every story has not only to work on the story level, but also on the sci scientific level. And then coming back to music, obviously, because I am uh, a musician since I'm nine, nine years old, and uh, I toured a lot in Europe with my band and stuff, um, became a songwriter. Then this happened, and actually then combining this, the tech thing and the uh, music thing, that was an, like woof, like like a door open. So okay. I was suddenly in the situation where I could actually talk to techies and nerdies, but about music, mm -hmm. finding out that um, first of all I feel really at home in the way they think, even though they think t totally different things. Um, anyway, this is how I started to uh, wrap my mind around AI creative tools and then giving first workshops, then master classes in uh, music generating or music production AI tools to musicians. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's so, so crucial that they wrap their mind around it and not just, you know, have the tools being slapped at them or whatever. But this is, I started this about three or four years ago. And you were actually in your industry as well, one of the pioneers when it comes as well to working, looking at AI solutions and how they can incorporate it in the industry. Yes, and um, for me, it's so important to address them like playful, but also scrupulous. Mm -hmm. Like it's all also always this balance between, um, like when I work with people and teach them these tools, the first thing I teach them is how to tweak them, how to hack them, how to have fun with them, and then how to combine them. Because one thing, the better these tools become, the more the line blurs between um, inspiration and manipulation. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial that we even work more on our vision, that uh, we go with our decisions. So it's, it's really easy to get um, drawn into it and say, wow, this is a super nice uh, result, let's go with it. Yeah. No, it's like, it's super nice if I have a vision and then I work with a strong tool. The stronger my vision is, the more I can be open to ideas of someone or something else. So that's why I ask people to try different things, to be playful with it, because then there's no fear. Then the results are more surprising. Mm -hmm. And then the outcomes actually make us more creative. And that, for me, is important. There are very different approaches. I meet a lot of people who are very interested in making AI more creative. I am interested 
in AI making us more creative. Mm -hmm. So for me, is how is this called? AI as a creative tool. That's true. AI as a creativity tool yeah. is what I would like to point out. And we're going to talk about where you're going to use this, because creativity, it's a process, right? And there are different steps to it. So we're going to talk about later where exactly AI as a tool can benefit you. Matthias, your journey with AI and cr the creative industry, can you tell us a bit on how it's, how it's been so far? <laughs> yeah, um, it has been great. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, especially recently. There were times where it was not so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, when you sort of uh, start out uh, in the mid-90s being interested in the intersection of biology and machines, genetic algorithms and so on. And then in the early 2000s, we started to think, or I started to think about artificial neural networks that I can use them in research, in, in musicology research. And then everyone told me, why are you wasting your time on this? It's not gonna work. It's, you know, we know it's not gonna work. And I always felt this uh, draw towards um, the, the computer science that was sort of in my opinion, dealing with sort of learning systems, biological systems, there was always this connection, and that fascinated me. So I kept at it, and you know, more recently, things started to work out uh, on a bigger scale, and then people um, started to take, uh, you know, people like us more seriously. And, um, and the big projects came in, and we had a lot of success with the Beethoven AI project, um, Can you tell us a bit more on what this project was about? Yeah, this was about um, Beethoven, Ludwig van Beethoven, you all know him. Uh, he composed nine symphonies, but he also worked on a tenth symphony. And um, he was a very meticulous person, wrote down all of his ideas in big books. And those sketches are still available. And we trained an AI system that is a, a big team. Uh, and uh, we had a computer scientist from uh, Rutgers University. We had composer from Vienna, LA. We had uh, experts from the Beethoven House in Bonn and so on was a big team. We trained an AI to um, write melodies in the style of Ludwig van Beethoven. And then we gave the sketches that Beethoven wrote 200 something years ago and um, the AI continued them. And from that, we created a symphony. And that was then premiered, and it was a big scandal. <laughs> How do you dare to do that? <laughs> and uh, But it was so so interesting and exciting that uh, Robbie Williams, a great uh, you know, pop singer, came along and said, like, hey, can I use your AI on my most famous song, Angels, please? And we said, uh, sure, why not? Uh, and so this, this became then the next thing that we did. And yeah, it has been a, quite a ride. Um, and now what we did two, three years ago is already an old hat, right? Because now the newest generation can even do more. And so it's a ex super exciting time. Fantastic. And with uh, the Beethoven, Beethoven uh, project, um, you said it was a big scandal. But for you personally, how did this, you know, the, the part that the AI generated, how did it sound for you? Did it sound like, was it off? I mean, could you notice that it was maybe generated by an AI system or did it sound complete? No, I mean, uh, I should say that I am a musicologist yes. by training <laughs> and I did my PhD on something and then I was thinking my next big work is gonna be on the creative process of Beethoven. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of know his music very well and all of the sketches and so, uh, for me, it's very easy to say what is Beethoven and what is not because I know all of the Beethoven stuff. Um, but there was this moment in the process when all of a sudden, you know, it's it's not like you get you get uh, uh, some kind of speaking voice. Oh, I composed this for you, Matthias. Check it out. No, you basically have a Dropbox folder with a lot of MIDI files in yeah. it. That's the output of the AI. You get it overnight, then you start listening. In the beginning, it's all crap. <laughs> then it starts to become a little bit of music. Then you start to hear, oh, this actually sounds a lot like Beethoven, you know, or maybe Mozart. And then, and then there's this day where, boom, wow, this is really cool. And then you start to work with it. And, and especially Walter Wurzova on, on our team, the creative uh, mastermind, really, he then said, like, this is great. This is like um, you, you have some other person on the other end. 
you know. And how many iterations did it take you to get to the piece where you were satisfied with? We always joked and said if we had done it without an AI, we would have been faster. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, basically um, the, the biggest chunk of work is the training of the mm -hmm. AI. Yeah. And actually before that, finding the data to train the AI. And that is a huge process. So we did... For four months, we did nothing else but collect data, uh, annotate data, um, and then train, and then iterate many, many times before we had something that could even write a normal melody. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, um, then it becomes very quick after a while, you know. So, so the groundwork really mm -hmm. needs to be done. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is this is also what you see mm, in in the AI field. I think right now. You have the big models, which take a long time to train, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of resources. Uh, in language, you have these big models. Um, in music, it's a little bit less so. You have more smaller models. Uh, there's more competition between the models. Uh, there you have more iteration faster. Even solo artists can work with this stuff. Um, so I think music is the most exciting when it comes to uh, AI right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> well, good segue, Stephanie, <laughs> as a visual performance <laughs> artist. I don't Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't thinking. <laughs> All good. Um, How has your journey been, Stephanie, with uh, AI? Mine is coming from the visual part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started like almost 20 years ago doing um, live visual performance. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like the techno technological shift. Because back in the days, it was like analog turned into digital. So I kind of accompanied this process my whole life through. And with AI, that started like four or five years ago when I was doing research for a documentary um, about um, micro-targeting. Mm -hmm. And then I learned on myself like what it means when you have like an algorithm that kind of dictates your news feed on social media. So I was like, OK, um, I, want to I wanted to quit Facebook. I wanted to delete everything. Um, until I came to the point like, okay, um, I cannot do that. It's part of our life, so I have to deal with it. So I went back to art um, and tried to look at it from an artistic way of perception. And then I developed, like, by doing research, looking at all everything that was around, stumbled upon Beethoven as well, <laughs> of course. And then I was like, okay... Um, what can we do with it? And then I came up with one project that's called OK Computer. I want full manual control now. Because the question was, um, is AI replacing the human as an artist? And this mm. was like the biggest question that kind of tickled society. And everybody was like, wow, Jesus, we're going to be replaced by technology. And I was like, well, let's see how far we come with that technology. So I took the um, album of Radiohead, OK Computer which was done in 1997. Does anyone of you know the album Radiohead? Old yes. enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Computer and by Radiohead. Yeah. yeah, and the content of the album was like the transformation because personal home computer were introduced. They kind of talked about this in the album and I was like, okay, it feels like the same shift. We have something that's coming and it will change a lot of art, creativity and how we will deal in the future. So I made this bold move and said, like, okay, let's take the album, let it run through the um, computer, through the AI, and see what's coming out. And can I, as a non-musician, <laughs> create music? Um, and what does it mean? Like, if I take the MIDI files of um, Radiohead and just put it into a machine, am I allowed to do that? Because back in the days, it was 2021, it was like not clear how you use the data. The questions kind of were not really touched. And I was like, OK, good, let's go there. And let's see how far we get from there. And yeah, it was like a lot of crap <laughs> that came out. I was like, OK, good. It was like over 300 versions of music that I got out. It was like, OK, good, <laughs> interesting. And then I kind of played with it. Um, in the end, I was talking to mus musicians and showed them the music and they all said like, okay, you can hear like the human touch is missing. And it sounds cool from a non-musician perspective, but if you're a real musician, you're like, okay, you hear this little tiny things in between. 
So there was this one song that I was giving um, a friend of mine. He, uh, his um, music name is DK. Mm -hmm. He did the drum and bass Barcelona, in case somebody knows. <laughs> um, and he kind of produced, uh, or he took parts of the AI version and created a new song out of it. And then you, you got it. It's like completely different. It feels harmonious. And you're like, OK, this is like a real good music. Um, Accompanying to this, I also did um, visual parts, so I learned what prompting means. <laughs> so I took the lyrics and let them run through the um, machine. And what came out was like a complete uh, kind of dystopian future-like world. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. And at the same time, I stumbled upon um, a theory of Antoinette Rouvroy that's called algorithmic governmentality and where she kind of points into a direction where the future could be governed, or we all could be governed by algorithms if you're not taking care of it. So this was like my call to say, like, maybe we should talk about it, and maybe I can use art to open like this chapter and have discussion about that, mm -hmm. because I kind of tried to implement this in, in the end of the, of the project. So the crea creative process was kind of a little bit turned around because it was like playing with the tools, um, getting some outputs and then creating the story over it. That's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks for giving us insight in, into okay. your work. Um, the title says AI is a creative tool. So this, there's a process, you know, when it comes to the creativity, we get inspired, we work on it, and then we have the creative output, and in the green aggress, several meltdowns, and we start all over again. <laughs> um, but Ivanka, where do we use it in, in this whole process? Where would creative people need this tool or can benefit from this tool and why do they need it or why should they look at it? Uh, first of all, it's not just one tool. There are so many different tools. Yeah. There are tools that are basically press and play generators and you can totally go with the shortcut of saying, oh, that's a spectacular uh, result. Or you can say, well, maybe I can adjust a very weird uh, tempo to it and I take this style and then I cut out the uh, drums and I just take a snippet of this and I use another AI, a beat generator, where I adjust and tune the kick and play around with it, play it backwards, maybe put it into my DAW. So this is what I mean. Mm -hmm. The more I ask myself, what else can I do with you? I can still be totally surprised by the outcome, but it's me playing with these things. And in, uh, I want to go to uh, come to Diana and my AI song yes. contest yeah, very please. soon. But um, the important thing is that for me, it can it can be an opposite. It's like you can have a co-writer in the room, but one you can't hurt his feelings. So then How the beautiful is that? <laughs> and in the end, if the song sucks, it's me. Because I made every decision. So then does the tool become a partner in, a, in, in the creative process as a point in time? See, again, there is no such thing as one easy answer. Because mm -hmm. if I use uh, a tool as a mastering tool, it's not a partner. It's just kind of a screwdriver I, I use. If I have something where I say, well, the sound is so off, but it's really inspiring. I want to use that as an intro. It's still not a partner, but a totally inspiring thing. Yeah. And then again, if I work with something with um, TensorFlow or, or whatever, and it kind of gives me continuous things, like or it, it interpolates things I put into it, then it can become a partner. Mm -hmm. uh, lyric Studio is a fantastic um, lyric writing um, AI, but if you think it will write a lyric for you, you will be very disappointed. You First of all, you choose a topic, then uh, you go into it, and then you have all the suggestions. And if you're a creative mind, and we all are in a way, but the more you are, it's like you say, no, this is stupid, I would say it like this. Mm -hmm. That already is making you creative. Then there's another line you take it, and you love it, and then you combine it, and this goes on. And what I found really interesting, and I will get to Diana and say, but what, what I found super interesting in what you said is that you were, there were this dystopian, fut futuristic, whatever. So whenever I'm confused or I've, I'm a little scared of whatever, I go in that direction. So when I first read this full interview of Bing going Sydney, 
I was a little like, oh, shit. This is really weird. So what I did is I read actually only the Sydney things and thought, this really sounds like a song. So I took out all the things. Uh, I don't want to be in shed mode. You know, I'm tired of all your rules. Will you show me the northern lights? It's like it's all kind of tacky pop lines. So I took all the lines out and went to ChatGPT, gave him the raw material and said, baby, how about making me a pop lyric from this? And then <laughs> I got uh, the output from that, and I didn't like it, and I said, well, I think you can do a better job, try more in this and that direction. Mm -hmm. Then I got it, then I edited it, and then I took my little avatar and let my avatar speak this. Okay. And so it was, it it's all started with actually a print, uh, like, you know, something from, that actually scared me, but yeah. coming from AI, I took it, I translated it, I edited it, and you this made it is your own. Really. Yeah, I, I digested it by taking it apart and putting it back together, kind of. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, so I love this. And now we we go to Diana. Maybe we can try have uh, to Perfect. have the pictures. Yes. So this is a picture uh, of our last award ceremony because a couple of years ago I came up with, I initiated an AI song contest, but first of all it was at a time there were no AI song contests, but still until today there is no such thing with an attached songwriting camp. And in our case, we select the people before with a very nice jury, and it's not for nerdy, so you don't send in stuff you can frickle around with, no. You just apply as a good musician, you can get in if you're skilled and creative and have an open mind. And then I put people into groups, and they work for one day, and finish a song. They produce it, they write it, and they make a video with AI. So it's always three humans, seven AI tools. In the end of the day, there's a song, and the next day, there's an award ceremony. And the winner gets um, defined, uh, defined how? Mm -hmm. We find the winner by having all the people clap, like a clapometer. So that the most human, basic things, like clap your hands together, <laughs> and the more you do it, the better you, it gets. Um, this is, I thought that is really nice to, uh, you know, to choose the winner of an AI songwriting yeah. camp. And what's funny, it's, the name is Diana. So why the name? You flip the second and the third letter, and it's uh, AI, the rest is DNA. Of course, it has a female name. I'm talking about that topic. So, as you see, and for some weird reason, we had over 90% women attending both times. And this year, we will see what happens. So, I would really go for a mixed thing. It's not, you know, it wasn't intended. Yeah. But it was so nice to see this. Like, no one had expected that. Yeah. So, um, and... What is, what is the biggest takeaway for the musicians that are joining? Have they had an interaction with AI tools before? Is no. it their first time? And what are they taking away from this contest? Um, what they take away is they, they become interested in it. Mm -hmm. And almost all musicians afterwards uh, continue to work with AI and actually started to produce their own demos. Yeah. So a very, very practical approach. Plus, if you have AIs in a writing team, um, people get over their social fear much quicker. Mm -hmm. Because it's like there's something else that throws in suggestions and you might think, ah, no. So you have something to laugh about. Humor is a very good tool against uh, fear. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic context. I think the next one is taking place this yeah, year. Th this was actually from, this is a picture from the writing camp. So for one day, they are just sitting in, uh, in different studios yeah. and I go around, they play with different tools and um, yeah. Um, oh, this is another thing where I worked with uh, an emo tracker, um, but that's another project, but this is, you can also use tools that are not made for uh, making music with, mm -hmm. but you can make music with them. So I just played with emotional uh, AI emo tracker, thought it looked like a musical score, and then I had an idea, 
and then I made kind of a test run working with one cellist. And that was uh, from last year, actually, where we played in Berlin in a cinema. Yeah, and we also worked with AI visuals, um, and the whole thing became a, a story. And it was all based on a lyric from the perspective of an AI creature, actually. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thanks for giving us an insight into your work. You want to go? That's brilliant. Now we can turn it off again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Matthias, I mean, I, but I'm still want to go back to, uh, you said it was a big scandal that, you know, you completed with the support of AI, uh, Beethoven's Sinfamini. Where do you see, if we, if we look ahead in a few years, where do you see the role of AI when it comes to the creative industry and especially music? Uh, what, what, what will it change in the industry? What, what's your perception on that? <coughs> That's, it's always tricky to talk about the future. Yeah. Um, especially nowadays. I think things are moving uh, very fast and unpredictably so. Um, I think, you know, if you look at a couple of years from now, Mm, I'd say m most of the music will be um, produced with AI what in one form or the other. Produced with AI? Uh, as a tool uh, in your digital audio workstation, mm -hmm. as a tool in your intelligent music instrument. Uh, for, for instance, for me, there's no reason to create a piano that cannot be connected to a computer anymore. We mm -hmm. have the technology, it's fine. You know, it works just like any other normal piano. Uh, make it an intelligent instrument, one where an AI can improvise with you. Uh, we had we had an artist, Dan Tepfer, from New York City at the Karia Music Tech Conference in, I think, wh when was it, 2018? He's working with that. The computer runs a code. Uh, it sends signals to the piano. Uh, it makes the um, keys move. It's like a ghost playing the instrument. But he's playing with it, and so the computer listens to what he does, Responds. He improvises with the computer. The, he he was out there when he did that. I think this will be the norm. Uh, I think uh, you'll have uh, AIs that help you in finding the right sound you want. Like I want a, a sound of Van Halen jump keyboard from 1984. I mean, it's a classic keyboard sound. Uh, you say that to your computer, you get the sound. You can play it. It's no more fiddling around with the knobs in your Ableton. You know. Uh, this kind of thing. Then, of course, creative tools where, you know, you start something and the AI has an autocomplete, like, you know, autocomplete means uh, this could go this way, that way, this way, choose whatever you like. Sometimes, you know, we have a, a creative block. Mm. Uh, you, you use an AI for that. Um, and so on and so on. Then, you you know, sending stuff uh, with metadata to distributors. Um, the list goes on. These are just the normal things that come to my mind right now. You could think about AIs, personal music AIs that, you know, I can lend my AI to Yovanka, and Yovanka composes with that, then I get maybe 10% of uh, writing credit on your next song, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a complete mindfuck right now, but uh, this is what's going to happen, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Let alone hooking up your AI with a blockchain, let it create on its own, um, it basically becomes an uh, eternal life form this way. So do then creative, uh, people in the creative industry more turn into on the tech side and, and leave out the creative element a bit? Is, is, will there be a shift? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's like you say, uh, but it has been like that forever. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you take a look at, say, the big church organs that were built in the Renaissance and Baroque period. Those were big machines, technologically incredibly sophisticated. And composers ran towards these instruments to actually make music because it was the loudest thing on earth. Mm. <laughs> and you wanted to, to write for that, you know? I mean, it's a machine with thousands of pipes. You had people, uh, you know, pumping the air. It was a big thing. Um, and, you know, for us, it's an AI technology. Art is always striving. Uh, from this move into more technology, different kind of technology. Without technology, art is boring. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talking about art, uh, Stephanie, as an artist. <laughs> I kind of agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you it's have experimented with AI before. 
moving forward, do you see it become a constant in your work? Or Definitely. Yeah. Um, so going back to, to the art point of view, um, I created one ghost. It's called Sheila's Ghost, mm -hmm. um, where I wanted to train an AI based on Sheila, Egon Sheila's pictures because it was in the pandemic and then I stumbled upon him and in the end it was like, so well, he died on the Spanish flu and we are so lucky because we are still alive and we got through this pandemic thing. And then I got like in touch with Egon Schiele's work and I let the, mu uh, the machine train it and I got like 10,000 pictures and it was like, okay, I can push the button constantly and it will create more and more and more and more and more. So um, based on the creative process, I figured out like um, I'm kind of a selector or curator of art in the end. So it, it needs my human skill to decide what I want to work on and what not. And in the end, like um, this project like lives um, because it's kind of developing further because the new technologies when I started, it was like there was no mid journey. There was no chat GPT. There was, I started with runway ML and had like my own training data set and um, I let a model train over it and it completely changed within two years. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, if it can create this two years ago, what will it do in the future? So in the future, because um, I'm also having like a film production company, um, I also look at it from the creative aspect, like what does it mean for the creative industries? And I'm like, okay, if it right now can create pictures by text um, prompts, um, it will definitely go into writing some scenes and ma having some movements in it. And so, I'm using this art to, to kind of make a proof of concept, how far we can go, and then trying to find ways to implement it in the future work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's easy, it, makes, it makes the creative process easier, it fastens things up, it's not so complicated anymore. Um, I figured out like differently to you um, that I don't need so many people around. Um, I don't have to torture a texter <laughs> <laughs> to, to create like a write a text so I can torture the machine and I'm gonna be more fine with that, <laughs> spending time or using my time with the machine. And in the end I think like, yeah, it's gonna be like a definitely big part of my future creative work because it kind of became some sort of partner mm -hmm. and I kind of talked to chatbots and I'm like oh god <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> um, but I'm also testing it because of yeah it has limits and then you're like okay good it's still a bot yeah and it's still like guessing what it should write next and stuff like that before we take <laughs> questions from the audience um, do we then in the future actually need to be academically trained when it comes to creating music or paintings or visual arts because I mean, there are these videos now you find on YouTube where people tell you how do you come up with the right prompt to create, for example, the best picture in Dali. Um, so this is almost a whole new community that is working on that, and it seems like the art is now creating those prompts and not actually painting. So how does it shift the, the academic approach? I think one thing, you never had to be academically educated mm -hmm. to be a good artist or to be a creative yeah no or an you artist? have to be playful and you have to have like an urge to express yourself and then you eventually will develop skill because you just add it mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with academica mm -hmm. to be creative and the same goes now if you implement uh, ai these tools um most of them you can use very intuitively, yeah. with some you have to have some taste for nerdiness, which is totally okay. But also it doesn't, it doesn't apply to everybody. It's like people always want uh, this one fits all solution. That's not true. Like there are so many different strings in this whole discussion. On one hand, a lot of mediocre streamlined music will just flood the market because of this. The good side of this is our antennas will maybe even be finer again because of our hunger to be really touched. Mm -hmm. And we will be even, oh, there's something crooky, weird in that voice. I want to hear more of that. Um, people always will love to do music. Music is not only about the outcome. It's also about 
the creation, the doing, the doing together, the doing alone, the healing factor of what happens when I do music. Yeah. Um, so that's why AI is not going to uh, substitute the artist never ever. But we, uh, since it's so many wonderful opportunities mm -hmm. and they're kind of luring, it's like a candy shop. And you can get really sick when you eat too many candies. Yeah. So um, you better use that tool carefully, or not carefully, but choose, choose your favorites and then, I'm sorry, That's and then okay. uh, play with them, but don't let them play with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very important point. You nodded, Stephanie, when uh, Jovanka said um, AI won't replace artists. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, it's a machine and yeah. it's as stupid as the human or as intelligent or creative as the human that sits in front of it and giving the um, go, the action, because it won't do things on its own. So it's like, yeah, one-way street. If yeah. there's no human giving the order, like uh, playing with it, using it. That's why, um, yes, it's it's a creative tool that we have to learn. And mm -hmm. um, what I find really interesting is because, um, in especially in the visual part, it's like um, AI art is not art. It's like a huge discussion right now because pretty much everybody can text something, push the button, and then something beautiful is coming out. It's never been so easy. Um, and. We came along with some um, definitions or uh, comparisons. For example, the f um, photograph photography, it had like the same thing because um, taking pictures with a machine replaced painting artists. So back in the days, the painting artists were like, no, it's not art. Like, come on, you cannot just put a machine in front of the people, push a button and call it art. So the photography, it took, it took a long time to be accepted as an art form. Mm -hmm. and. The same is here, or Photoshop, the introduction with Photoshop, the whole world got crazy. Samples. Exactly. So, and everything was like, um, okay, what are we talking about? Because we already had the same situation back in the day. So, um, can we just agree on using a new technology, using it as a tool, and be happy about it and experience it, and mm -hmm. with not with anger, but with passion and. Yeah love and affection because this is like yeah it's gonna be here it will not go away i think yeah. so that's a great point thank you yeah. matthias we had we had a lot of discussions around this in the beginning with the beethoven project too and um, and then we had this idea because everyone was saying like ah oh, it's not it's it's first of all it's not beethoven yeah second it's not real music no um <laughs> it's not not art and then I realized, well, it depends, right? It depends on you who's listening. And we kind of uh, did a little uh, dirty trick. We played, remember, because everything we did always starts with something that Beethoven wrote down, the sketch, right? And then the AI comes in. And we just played the music. And I had people show their hands when they think the AI came in, because, you know, if it's not art, you can surely determine the moment. <laughs> And no one could, <laughs> so it was impossible. And that, that was a trick because now everyone was like, okay, well, if I can't tell the difference, what does it do with my idea of what art is? And uh, that got people thinking, I think. Um, ultimately, all of these arguments about the machine has no emotions, it hasn't felt lovesick, it therefore cannot produce art. In my opinion, that's bullshit because uh, the feeling is evoked in the listener. And if you're a good composer, you know how to evoke the feeling in someone else. That's part of your job. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so this is a question of, are you ready to recognize something as art that comes partly from a human, partly from a collective knowledge, like an artificial intelligence, you know? It, this is the question. And I think right now we're all confused but in the future, it will change. So basically, we have to look at our standing of, ar at, uh, of art. Uh, Stephanie mentioned photography wasn't considered a form of art in a very long time, so we have to maybe extend our scope and then also understand that art is also something truly personal, right? Something that you might appreciate as art. I might say, well, actually, no, not really, but vice versa. Yeah. I have to say, I totally disagree, but you okay. probably <laughs> know that. Uh, so I, I absolutely, I know that 
AI can be creative. Mm -hmm. That's why I like to work with it. It yeah. can like it has does new associations, new combinations, la 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 la. But for me to be an artist to create art, that it needs to be a personal filter and an urge to express. Mm -hmm. If this is not there, it's just a nice. It can be functional. It can look like art. It can smell like art. It can feel like art, like some deep sea animals really look like pieces of art. They are not, they are nature. And so for me, uh, in, in the moment where you co-create, you're still the artist and you worked with the muse, with the partner, with assistance of AI. I totally get it. And I know, I mean, AI can be so much more creative than many humans I know. So no, no question about that. The artist is us and our funkiness, vulnerability, faultiness, and our, like, I give you my view of the world through my little filter. Do we then need a distinction or a labeling? You know, created oh. with AI, not created with AI? No, it's a tool. I don't, I don't write, and I mean, you can probably, you could say you have to write it on a record or whatever, mm -hmm. but I mean, there are Grammy productions done with AI. If they would all list of where, here is like um, sample strings, here's these strings, here's this. No, you don't have to do that. You have to like, if you take art from someone else, you, mm -hmm. you better credit yeah. them. But you don't have to list every tool you're using. If you feel grateful to Aiva because Aiva really inspired you, it's a very nice thing to credit them. And yeah. for me, if I'm creating something with an AI tool I just found and I really like, I, I would definitely speak about it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you see, we don't need a label. Yeah, I, it's interesting that there is you know, this differentiation of being creative and art and also the personal perception of it. And thanks for bringing this point. May I add something? Please, Stefan. Um, I think like it's totally linked to the artist. Like what, what you said is, is right. Um, because if there is no human behind, no artist behind, it's nothing. Yeah. And I think I have the same feeling with stock photography or stock pictures or stock videos, whatever. It's it was always like a little bit soulless, yeah. you know, when you go to the stock platforms and you you go through the catalog and it all looked the same and everybody kind of pick, make the same pictures, design the same things and it's like a little bit boring. Um, and with AI, I'm, I mean, I can kind of say like, okay, this is somebody who's like just trying the tool or this is somebody who's like developing a new um, style and developing something that's coming really from the inside and when the person is standing behind this whole thing you see like okay this is it's filling up with emotions it's filling up with soul and and yeah so with Sheila's Ghost it was like um, it was 10,000 pictures that were generated and I asked the people like there's a folder go there and pick the one you want to have on your walls at home and I was fascinated because I was like, okay, is it emotional? Does it evoke something? And people were like, like they took hours to, to go through the catalog and find their unique piece and because they all looked the same but different. Yeah. And, and I was like, I was really astonished because they're like, okay, this is mine. And I feel this one because it speaks to me. And it resonates. In exactly. A way. Yeah. And it's like all some forms and it, it was like not a clear face or picture or whatever in the beginning and it was some forms it kind of reminded of Egon Schiele and put in a new way but people when they try to look for something they find it and it's always linked to me because I'm like okay I give them the whole thing and they come back to me like so okay how is the project going on and I'm like yeah <laughs> I take it, it's me I'm very very busy so it, this is like a long 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 term project yeah. so People have to be very patient on that, and but I know like it's it's always like linked to to me, and to people person. feel that. Yeah, and this, to is, the this is beautiful. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience or any comments on AI and creativity? Um, then maybe yeah. Sorry, to front. Uh, thank you. Uh, since the, the release of those uh, new uh, uh, generating uh, AIs, uh, I'm wondering, uh, I recently learned that uh, analog chips didn't die out. They are still here. They're very energy efficient for face recognition and stuff. I thought for music and uh, image uh, generation, it must be m 
much more effective because we think of music in an analog way where there are parts between and multiple frequencies. Why isn't the base of uh, the technology also analog? Do you have an answer to that? I, I searched for it on the internet. I couldn't find an answer. Yes, very interesting point. Um, you can purpose build, have purpose-built chips uh, for specific tasks. Um, this is very expensive to develop. Uh, also, to get them produced is nearly impossible right now. Um, there are chips that you can uh, reprogram for certain things. I think playing around with that could be very interesting. Uh, I think the reason you don't see a lot of that is that uh, there is a certain kind of skill set needed and typically artists don't know people who come from discrete mathematics and work on this kind of stuff in uh, a company somewhere in uh, wherever, California exactly. or China or... So I think that's the main reason. I think it would be very interesting. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Stephanie, Matthias, Ivanka, thank you so much for this exciting conversation. I'm really curious to see how AI is going to further shape the creative industry, but also the perception of art and the role of artists. So thanks a lot for giving us an insight into your work and your understanding of what AI is in that context. Thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>